It does. Savage has been mayor since 2012 and was re-elected in 2016 and 2020. I'll talk to Mike Savage about his time in office as mayor of Halifax and where he sees the city going from here. That's our Newsmaker interview just after 6.30. All right, the time has come for the next blast of winter, and Ryan Snodden with us now to talk about that. Yeah, the snow has already started falling. It certainly has, and has now arrived in the Halifax area as well, and really ramping up uh, just to the west of Halifax, uh, up the south shore, uh, edging into central areas. And again, since we last saw you last evening, the winter storm warning has been dropped for northern areas, but this will still drop some snow for you folks as well. But looking more impactful for sure for the Atlantic coastline, into the northeast and into Cape Breton where the winter storm watches and warnings are still in effect. So everything kind of shifting south and uh, basically from Yarmouth, New Ross, Halifax Airport up into Picto, Anaganish, Cape Breton and south of that line, anywhere from 10 to as much as 25 centimeters. The closer you are to the Atlantic coastline, the better chance you have of getting up into that 20 to 25 range. And that is because yeah, that is closer to the storm system, which is off to the south. The winds are already picking up as well, sustained in the 30 kilometer per hour range to even 40 in Yarmouth, starting to gust here in the 50 to 60 range. And again, that is going to increase over the next few hours as well. There's the radar really filling in now. South shore edging into, uh, again, the Lunenburg area. That's pushing up towards Halifax as well. And it's starting to push into the eastern shore region as well. Again, heaviest snow is going to be just to the south, but we will get into some heavier banding through this evening into the overnight as those winds pick up. There's 10 p.m. and you can see those widespread gusts, 50, 60 and 70 kilometers per hour. Heaviest snow right along the Atlantic coastline. The amounts dropping towards the north, but everybody take, uh, picking up at least a taste of snow tonight. Note by 2, 3 a.m. already clearing in the west. Halifax starting to see those heavier bands of snow pulling out around that time as well. By the time we're waking up tomorrow morning, most of the mainland is snow free. A couple of lingering flurries, but for the most part tomorrow morning, this is going to be Anaganish, Guysboro and Cape Breton. And even you folks will see some improvements pretty quickly as we move towards the mid morning time frame. Blowing and drifting snow is going to be a concern all day in Cape Breton and along the Northumberland shore. And we'll certainly see a few flurries lingering even for western areas into the afternoon. Second wave coming in Wednesday night. This could drop an additional 5 to 10 centimeters for the northeast. We'll talk more about that and walk you through right into the weekend time frame, including uh, keeping an eye on an Alberta clipper as well. Uh -huh. as it's always active, so we'll uh, explain uh, what uh, that might mean to the forecast for your seven-day coming up. Yeah. Busy times. Never a dull right. moment. Okay, thanks so much, Ryan. Thank thanks, you. Ryan. Well, just 10 days after an historic snowfall that sent Cape Breton into a local state of emergency, residents are bracing for this next storm. The CBC's Nicholas Sagan reports. With snowbanks still piled high in downtown Sydney, people are getting their shovels out once again. The last storm, the largest in 20 years, brought 150 centimeters of snow to some parts of the province and had many Cape Bretoners trapped in their homes for days. The heavy snow pileup was too much for some roofs to handle, with collapses and structural damage reported. The Sydney Curling Club is one of the unlucky ones, closed indefinitely with a compromised roof. A huge blow to more than 300 members. It's just such a nice place to come and meet people and chat with people and see people throughout the community that you wouldn't necessarily interact with otherwise. So when we don't have curling or if we don't have curling for the rest of the season, it will be devastating. This week's storm is expected to bring another 10 to 25 centimeters of snow across Cape Breton, along with gusting winds. That's bad news for 7 by 7 restaurant, closed for 10 days with a crumbling roof and ceiling. It took us till Thursday from the storm to mm -hmm. get access to the front of the building. Barnes says contractors are set to begin work to fix the damage tomorrow morning, if the weather cooperates. It was concerning to me and I'm just hopeful that the storm tracks a little bit off and is, is less snow and less concern. But they'll be here at 7 o'clock in the morning barring any, any issues. 
The municipality is warning people to be prepared for the worst, with supplies for 72 hours. It's quite a bit of snow, and we've already received a lot of snow. We really can't handle more at this point. McQueen says all plows are on the roads trying to get ahead of it. Today, dump trucks started dumping snow into the harbour to try and keep the roads cleared for as long as possible. Nicola Sagan, CBC News, Sydney. Nova Scotia's Auditor General says the provincial government's purchase of an unfinished hotel for a patient care facility was a highly unusual transaction. In a report released today, Kim Adair flagged tens of millions of dollars in untendered contracts that did not follow proper protocol. But as the CBC's Michael Gorman reports, cabinet ministers responsible for the file are standing by the process. The Nova Scotia government paid $34.5 million for this unfinished hotel a year ago. It's putting another $17 million into renovating it to house hospital patients who no longer need a hospital bed but are not ready to go home. In a report released today, but the province's Auditor General says that purchase happened before the government knew if the site was appropriate to house patients or could even be renovated to do so. We were looking for value for money and what we expected to find was an environment where the due diligence work was done to make sure they would achieve value for money. But the purchasing arrangement, we've called it highly unusual by the fact that they dealt with a developer who was not the owner of the property. Kim Adair's report raised serious concerns about ballooning sole source contracts and untendered work worth tens of millions of dollars that did not follow proper protocols. But in a virtual availability, cabinet ministers responsible made no apologies for the process. They say the 68 new beds at the site near Bedford will ease congestion in hospital emergency departments and provide a more appropriate setting for people until they're ready to return home or go to a long-term care placement. Value for money represents much more than just the appraised value of a building. Our hospitals are full in Halifax and around the province. And Nova Scotians elected us to, to fix health care. Uh, a number of solutions have to, to be implemented here. Opposition members weren't buying that logic. They have uh, massively overspent a project that was dubious to begin with. Uh, there have been tons of trouble and we still don't have a transitional care facility. They put on their budget document last year more health care faster. And what we see from this report today is less health care, slower and more expensive. Thompson and LeBlanc say the process means the new beds will be ready two years sooner than if a building was started from scratch. Adair agrees the health care system needs a lot of help, but she says speed should not come at the expense of checks and balances. Michael Gorman, CBC News, Halifax. For seven long years, members of the Borden family have lived in a home in Guysborough County that was the scene of a terrible tragedy. It was there on January 3rd, 2017, that Lionel Desmond killed his wife, his mother, his 10-year-old daughter before turning the gun on himself. The family says they can't begin healing until they get out of that house and they need government help. Blair Rhodes reports. It's always been very simple. The family should be relocated out of that home. Sheldon Borden lost his sister Shana and his niece Aaliyah in the killings when a deeply troubled Lionel Desmond entered the home with a gun he'd just bought and opened fire. The family had hoped the fatality inquiry into these events would bring them closure. But the inquiry's mandate was focused on how the system failed Lionel Desmond and his family by not getting him adequate treatment for his acute PTSD and helping him transition out of the military. It seems to me you were better off just putting, instead of Desmond Fatality Inquiry, Lionel Fatality Inquiry. Because nothing here relates to assisting the Desmond family. Nothing, nothing here relates to assisting the Borden family for the tragedy that took place. You know, I certainly sympathize uh, in, on a personal level with, with uh, Desmond and Borden families. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Corporal Desmond's daughter would have been the same age my daughter is right now, graduating high school. So, you know, I, I really, I sympathize with the families. And I think uh, right now the most important thing is to, to really uh, take those recommendations that have come forward and uh, review them.
Brad Johns says the federal government is taking the lead on this file. The Veterans Affairs Minister, Jeanette Petipa-Taylor, says her department is studying the recommendations, and she's promised to reach out to the families. A spokesman for her department wouldn't say more, citing privacy concerns. But even if the two levels of government adopt all 25 recommendations in the Fatality Inquiry report, that won't address the Borden family's problems with the House in Upper Big Trachity. There are precedents that the family has cited in their campaign for support. Following the murders at a McDonald's in Sydney River in 1991, the restaurant was torn down. And in 2020, after the deadly rampage that started in Portapique, the province bought the gunman's waterfront property to make sure no one else would build on that land. Blair Rhodes, CBC News, Halifax. Commercial license holders are angry over Ottawa's plan to cancel the upcoming maritime elver fishery. Last year, hundreds of unauthorized harvesters ran rivers to cash in on the tiny eels that sell for $5,000 a kilo and are shipped live to Asia. Today, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans says it does not have enough time to put in place measures to prevent a repeat. Because of that, the minister told license holders the fishery should not open this year. Uh, extremely disappointed that after everything we've been through for the last number of years that DFO has had ample time to put in the necessary safeguards that they now turn around and throw their hands up and say we give up and in return we're just going to shut down the fishery which is going to have a devastating impact for my clients and for all the other license holders and their employees. Samsung predicts the black market will continue even if the legal fishery is shut down. The commercial fishery employs about 200 people during the spring season. Emotions ran high in Whitney Pier last night. People gathered to talk about a shelter village that's been proposed for the community. And the Premier heard the frustrations of those in attendance. Aaron Potty explains. You're asking us to put our residents at risk. Yeah. Yeah. It was a passionate crowd of more than 200 people. They gathered at a community hall to hear a presentation on the proposed shelter village and to have their voices heard. But the meeting quickly got heated with shouting, name-calling, cursing, and even threats of violence. Security officers were hired to control the crowd. Putting them in pallet homes in a community that is pretty much surrounded by the most vulnerable, I'm talking our young children, our children, and our older, our older people, you know, it, it does. It, it's going to create some hostility. 30 sleeping units are planned for a vacant lot in the community for people experiencing homelessness. Those who grew up in the neighbourhood say people are feeling disrespected. They're just trying to force it on us. They're going to get some resistance. Our community is going to push back and we're going to push back hard. A lot of community anguish and angst because the communication model was so poor. From day one there was no involvement and they used the excuse that they don't have to do it. Well I'm sorry, that's not what the community is very clearly telling them. They want to know why Whitney Pier was chosen as the site for the project, and they worry about their neighbours' safety. Nova Scotia Premier Tim Houston was a surprise guest at the meeting. He says there will be further discussions about the site's location. It'll be a process. Um, I came here with, a, with, a, with an honest intention to hear from the community, and, and I've, I've heard lots, and we'll go back and, and talk about it to the team about it. Project partners who will manage the shelter site say these buildings will provide people with a warm and safe place to sleep until further living arrangements can be made. Erin Potty, CBC News, Whitney Pier. A lawyer representing a tenter who was denied an increase in income assistance by the province says he is asking for a judicial review of the case. Bradley Lowe felt strongly that his tent was his home and his support payments from the province should reflect that. Could what started as a legal fight to better his own life become his legacy to others? When is a tent a home? I do on my own accommodation. That is the crux of the argument over whether to more than double the amount of income assistance for some people living rough in Nova Scotia. It's pretty modest, but I own it. The outcome could dramatically change the lives of so many who right now don't seem to have much of a life at all. This is the story of a likable guy living rough who could become an unlikely agent of change. Like a lot of people that live in the area or live on the street or in tents, this is where they come to stay warm for the day. 
Laura Walton was working at Halifax Central Library's front desk last fall when Bradley Lowe struck up a friendship with her. I was just chatting to him about I loved his hair color. He was like, oh yeah, I want to grow it and donate it. And it's like, oh, like that's unexpected. That's not what I would expect to hear. But he just loved sharing, like that's what he wanted to do. So that was a very admirable quality and something really different. Just down the street, Victoria Park. Among downtown Halifax's most expensive condos, a tent encampment. Here, lawyer Vince Calderhead came to know that same bright light, Bradley Lowe, who was living in a tent here. It's all he could afford. Right off the bat, he seemed kind of special, quite unique. He told me about his situation and, and uh, the fact that he needed income assistance and how much he was getting. And uh, when he told me the amount, that was just outrageous. Bradley Lowe was receiving $380 a month from the province. But under provincial regulations, someone who rents a place to live or owns a home and has a disability or chronic mental condition could get the enhanced rate of $950 per month. Could Bradley appeal his income assistance? And he looked at me and I looked at him and he said, look, I do own my own accommodation. It's pretty modest, but I own it. And, uh, you know, he had stuff there. He had to make arrangements. He had ongoing shelter costs. So he felt he fit the definition. Yeah, he totally did. Bradley Lowe became hooked on prescription opioids as a teenager recovering from an injury. Through his 20s, he worked in construction and kitchens, and he was in and out of rehab, battled depression and anxiety. An addict who recently was drug-free. And his favorite title? Father. Yeah, yeah, four years old. Uh, and uh, he said, look, I've got a... I've got to get myself together for my son. I've got to maintain uh, on the straight and narrow for my son. I've, uh, I don't want to go into high-risk situations. Why? It's bad for him, but more importantly, to maintain his relationship with his son. It'd be nice to give people at least some, some level of funding that's beyond a few hundred dollars a month. Michael Ganuick works with opioid addicts. He says his patients have a fighting chance at a better life, living away from the turmoil and the temptation in the tents. If you're unhoused, how could you ever focus on, you know, improving your mental well-being or, you know, getting treatment for an addiction? It's really the priority is housing. And so uh, giving people who are unhoused the financial support to maybe help them get closer to housing is so important for them to meet their other health needs. Last month, Bradley and his lawyer made their case for more money before the Income Assistance Appeal Board. We had come back from the hearing and he said to me, Look, it's, it's really fortunate that we met because I, uh, of all the people in the encampment, I feel I'm both together enough and, and focused enough to pull this off, but also I'm determined to see this through. Then, a week later, not long before Christmas, Bradley overdosed a possible drug poisoning news of his death hit hard. That same day that Laura Walton learned of Bradley's passing, another tenter had overdosed in front of her at the library. So our security guard was able to use Narcan to revive them, which was great. And then when I was talking to one of the other security guards about it, he was like, yeah, it's really sad, you know, like what happened to Brad? So I hadn't heard about that at that point. So. You know, when he told me that, it was so sad because to see someone revived, I don't know them, but you would hope someone like Brad would have been revived and that someone I would have loved for someone to have been there to help him because he was someone who wanted to help other people. So it was really sad. Yeah. And the cruelty of it all, Bradley Lowe was in line for a bed in a rooming house just two days later. In mid-January, a month after his passing, the board dismissed Bradley's appeal. So what is the best way to help those in tents? The province argues increasing income allowance rates right now is not the way to go. It says it has spent millions on shelters. Best for people living in tents to take immediate refuge there, according to the Minister of Community Services, Trevor Boudreau. 
we've put the money forward to to provide that support for people who are living in in, in encampments. And so, you know, it, it is a challenge. People are saying they don't want to go, and 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 this is you know this is frustrating because we have a space that is, is that is available. We have capacity there right now. Vince Calderhead says many who have mental health issues or drug addictions won't leave their tent home, such as they are, because the shelters have no sense of community and too many rules, including around drug use. He says it's hard to not let the futility of it all set in. This is an ongoing struggle, and, and for people who are trying to get their human rights respected, Canada and Nova Scotia have have uh, agreed that everyone is entitled to an adequate standard of living. And look, look what we're tolerating, look what we're putting up with. I mean, people living in remarkably inadequate circumstances. All right, so Tom, for those living in tents, what now? Well, if Bradley's lawyer is successful in having a judicial review overturn this case, he argues that Bradley's income assistance should be paid retroactively to Bradley's estate and eventually the hope would be to his son. And he says this case could be precedent setting for other homeless people living in this province. All right, Tom, thanks for this. Okay, well, under our first quick break of the night, please stay with us. Yes, we have a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. Talks aimed at a potential truce between Israel and Hamas are underway in Cairo. And there is the scene from Lunenburg just moments ago. Ryan is up next with his weather forecast. We'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, outside our studio windows here, it's been snowing mm -hmm. a little bit uh, for the last hour and a bit or so. Yeah, and it, this has been a tricky one, right? Oh. <laughs> okay. says it all, I didn't need it? to tell you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. And again, as I mentioned last night, not just for me, no. but all of the eastern seaboard, New York, uh, Boston, uh, just changeable forecasts. It's the totals, right? That's what's hard to nail down. Yeah, exactly, because the track has been wavering. Now, some good news here is that, you know, no snow is good snow, as we mm. just saw the report from Sydney, right? They don't need any more. Uh, but we are, the silver lining here is we're dodging a bullet. Have a look at this map. This shows you the 30 to 50 centimeter swath, wow. which could have fallen across us, mm. will miss us, thankfully. But boy, Eastern Newfoundland, the Avalon, they're mm -hmm. in for they're, one. They're gonna yeah. get it, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. they're definitely getting it's it. It's a lot of purple. It's a lot of purple. Now for us, again, as we zoom in, uh, we're gonna be generally in that uh, 10 to 25 centimeter range across southern and eastern parts of the province. It looks like the closer you are to the, that Atlantic coastline, the better chance you will have to see the 20 to 25 totals. And again, uh, kind of starting as a bit of a wet snow this evening, but will certainly turn into a fluffier snowfall overnight tonight as the colder air wraps in on the backside of the system and the winds become a factor as well. Blowing snow is going to be an issue, hence the winter storm warnings and winter storm watches, which are in effect. Those winds are already kicking up. Talking about sustained winds right now, 30, 40, yeah, and even 60 at last check at Westport. So the winds starting to, you know, move in on the north. It's a nor'easter, right? And uh, yeah, uh, you can see gusting uh, near 80 at Westport right now. Gusting near 50, Yarmouth and Shelburne, 43 in Halifax. So this thing is just getting going here. And we're starting to see some pretty heavy snow bands working their way in here along that South Shore region, edging into Halifax. Uh, radar doing a uh, funky thing here, but uh, we are certainly seeing some uh, flurries pushing up in the vicinity of that Northumberland Shore region. But again, this is where we're going to see that sharp cutoff from significant to lighter to nada across New Brunswick and western parts of PEI. There's the storm system itself, and again, that is going to be moving uh, just to our south tonight, and we're just on that snow zone to the northern edge, and we'll be uh, watching this one move quickly. Uh, it moves through in a pretty good hurry, so let's time it out for you one more time. Those northeast winds becoming more northerly tonight, 50 sustained, gusting 60, 70, even some 80 kilometer per hour gusts as we just saw there. Digby Neck and exposed coastal areas will be really gusting. No temperatures near minus three for Cape Breton tonight. Uh, this model doing a pretty good job with the snow in terms of uh, it's been timing it out pretty well all day today. Uh, and again, that moves through in a pretty good hurry. And you can see by the time we get to 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, we are looking at uh, those those winds that are going to be uh, no doubt uh, still gusting in through Cape Breton around 70, 60 to 80 kilometers per hour uh, for tomorrow morning there. The rest of us, we're waking up, the, the system is gone, right? As I showed you earlier, 2, 3 a.m., it looks like the backside is pulling out of Halifax. Maybe a few lingering flurries after that. Uh, done even earlier for, uh, for Yarmouth, but it's going to add up in a hurry, and then it's going to move through in a hurry. And by the time we get to noon tomorrow, the system snow is done. Still some flurries, and this is what we're going to be watching for tomorrow night, is a couple of squalls to develop, and a few flurries pushing into places like the valley. Minus two, minus three tomorrow. Those northerly winds still gusting upwards of 70 kilometers per hour for a good portion of the day for Cape Breton and the Northumberland shore. So blowing snow will be an issue all day in this neck of the woods. Uh, for the Fundy and Valley region, yeah, still gusting to 50, but blowing snow, I think only a concern really for the early to mid morning and then uh, we'll start to taper off. We're going to be looking at those uh, winds gusting to 50 through a good chunk of tomorrow in through uh, the Yarmouth and South Shore regions and in Halifax as well near minus five to minus six. Now let's walk you through Wednesday night. This is that secondary push I talked about. Another five to 10 centimeters on top of that snowfall uh, for the Northumberland shore and Inverness County in particular. Another five possible for Sydney and some light accumulation possible Wednesday night, even areas uh, towards the Halifax area. Note Thursday, still quite gusty. Yarmouth, 65, 70 kilometer per hour gust possible there uh, into Cape Breton. I think most of us will gust at least to 60 uh, with coastal gusts to 70 on Thursday with temperatures ranging from around zero to minus three on Thursday. I teased this earlier. This is an Alberta clipper and true to its name, it's going to be clipping through at a really good pace fast. Uh, thankfully, models trending south with the track of this through the Gulf of Maine to our south. 
and perhaps dodging this one completely, maybe some flurries in the southwest, but it looks like accumulation will not be a factor with this one, uh, thankfully. A bit cooler this weekend, uh, perhaps a bit cloudier as well. I think we will see a taste of sun, but uh, yeah, we've got uh, this system to get through tonight and then hopefully some quieter weather. <laughs> yeah. one, yes. one at a time, yeah. one day at sure. a time. Okay, okay thanks, thanks so much, Ryan. Ryan. Thanks, guys. Well, up next, I'll talk with HRM Mayor Mike Savage about his decision to not run again in this fall's municipal election. That's our Newsmaker interview. Please stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News. HRM Mayor Mike Savage announced today that he will not be reoffering in the fall election. After 12 years as mayor, he says it's long enough. Mayor Mike Savage is with us now. Sir, why this decision and why now? Well, look, it's, uh, the election is this year. It's in the fall. Um, I'm going to be going away for a week with my wife in, um, uh, later this week. And, you know, the, the idea was maybe we'd... I think about it while I was away, but the fact is I, I think I've known for some time that probably this is where we were headed. Um, for me, it's the right decision, and uh, yeah, I just think after 12 years, that's a long time. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the decision, my family's comfortable with it, and uh, it's a job I'll miss. I love doing it. I love the job. I, I, it's been a great honor and a privilege, um, but it's time. 
Twelve years is a long time in politics. You said today that longevity is, is not a sign of success, though. It, it's what you do in your time in office. You still have, you know, eight months uh, in right. office to come. But looking back, you know, what do you point to that you think you helped accomplish for this city? Well, you know, whenever there's um, work that has to be done in a community, it's done by everybody. Um, but I think as mayor, I've, I've had a role to play. When I became mayor, the downtown was stagnant. There was very little growth in the municipality. Um, I didn't think we had a great relationship with uh, the First Nations uh, here, the Mi'kmaq people. I thought there was a lot of work to be do done on inclusion um, and, uh, and making the city more livable and growing. And so in the last 10 years, we've seen enormous growth, the fastest growing downtown in Canada, which is really important, um, and, and record growth. And seeing people come from around the world to come to Halifax, uh, to be a city that's actually <clears throat> getting younger is kind of a cool thing that's attracting people to come here. Uh, and that respects and understands that uh, the climate is changing. And if we don't change with it, then we're, uh, we're not going to do very well. So I, I think we've done well in a lot of those things. I'm very proud of that. And there's more to be done. And the work of the city will continue long after I've gone. Do you, do you worry about the rate of growth, the kind of growth that we're yeah. seeing, and, and sort of the impacts of it, both sure. good and bad? Yeah, you know, as a city, we started looking at this a long time ago, before other orders of government, I think, recognized it. Um, the center plan, which started a number of years ago, was all about densifying corridors in and out of the city. Um, and so a lot of orders of government are now uh, on the issue of growth and supply. I think we were there before. And even as a city who have no direct responsibility for homelessness, uh, we set up a housing and homelessness partnership within the first year of me being mayor. And we've done a lot of work on that. And that's obviously a challenge that has to, uh, has to be met. But we'll meet it. You know, this is the city that survived the Halifax explosion. We went through the tragedy of the mass shootings. We've survived COVID. We had the worst floods in our history, the worst fires in our history, and we go on because that's what we do. We keep put one foot in front of the other and uh, being not just a bigger city, but a better city. That's what we do. Yeah, there are tough decisions ahead as always. I know you alluded to your father, John, today, who was a Premier of Nova Scotia, of course, back in the mid-1990s. As a political leader, made some unpopular tough decisions himself, and many would say he paid the price for them. I'm just curious what you have learned over the years about making tough decisions in politics. Well, I think one of the strengths that I brought to the job, I believed this when I ran, and I um, believe that I could say that I've been able to practice it, is bringing people together and understanding the challenges that face us and, and, and working on them together. But at the end of the day, we have to make decisions, and not everybody likes the decisions that we make. And uh, I get that, whether it's taking down the statue of Edward Cornwallis uh, or whether it's developing the city at a rapid pace. You know, I believe that we've made the right decisions uh, by and large, but there's always going to be some mistakes and there's always going to be somebody else that will look back and say, you could have done this differently. And I expect there's cases that we could. Um, but I think at the end of the day on certain things, climate change, social justice, the importance of growth, um, we can talk all day long, but at the end of the day, we have to make decisions and we have to have faith in them as leaders and we have to go on. I know you've lived a life in politics, in, in party politics, uh, and then in municipal politics. I'm just curious, when you, when you look back on that sort of spectrum of, of politics that you've been involved in, what would you say about municipal politics? It's the best. It's the toughest. It's the messiest. But it's the best. It's the, it's by, it's the, open, it's the only open kind of politics, I think, that you see today in the, in the public square. Um, at a point in time when we're becoming so polarized um, in our politics, I've always considered myself to be a passionate, progressive, moderate, somebody who believes in social justice but also believes you've got to pay the bills. And I don't think that tradition is all that far from the traditions of progressive conservative and liberal, the, the people I admire in politics, the, you know, the Paul Martins and the, the Joe Clarks, Brian Mulroney, Jean Chrétien, uh, Pierre Trudeau, um, John Savage, and some of them may be more uh, progressive than others, but I believe in that, and at, the, at our level, at our order of government, municipally, we actually change our mind, and that's one of the greatest signs of strength in a political leader, is somebody who will change their mind, and you don't see it provincially and federally very often. You see it here every single Tuesday, and I think that's because people listen to each other and have an open mind. You're not going to change your mind about this decision today? No, I'm, uh, listen, I'm very comfortable with it. It's, it's something that suits me and, and my family. 
and there's got to be something else out there for me. I don't know what it's going to be. I, don't, I, I really don't know what's next for me. I've got some months to figure it out. I'm not going to retire um, completely. Uh, I'll, I'll meet with anybody that wants to run for mayor and maybe ask me you know, what it's like, the good and the bad. I'll, I'll do that. I've been very proud to work with the people I have on, on my councils. And uh, I know that the city will continue and will flourish and we will meet the challenges of today under other people, under other leaders, and that that's a good thing. I know you still have a few months on the job. We'll probably chat again. Mayor Mike Savage, thanks for the conversation tonight. Sure thing. Anytime. I appreciate it. Coming up, unseasonably warm temperatures and a lack of snow are causing concern in some parts of the country. Welcome back. Talks aimed at reaching a truce between Israel and Hamas are underway in Cairo. Officials from U.S., Egypt and Qatar are taking part. In Gaza, meanwhile, Palestinians are fleeing Rafah ahead of a possible Israeli military assault. Abby Kuvasan has the latest. 
The U.N. says it hasn't received any evacuation plan for Rafah from Israel, but it says regardless of any plan, it does not participate in forced evacuations. There are about 1.4 million Palestinians sheltering in the south of Gaza in Rafah. Satellite images show just how much more densely populated the area has become in recent months. There are about five times more people there now than in mid-October. South Africa has now made an urgent ask to the ICJ to consider using its power Power to intervene in Rafah. This as mediators discuss a possible end to the war in Cairo, but Washington acknowledging there are gaps. Last week, Hamas demanded that the IDF fully withdraw from Gaza as part of a counter-proposal to end the war and release all the hostages. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected that offer and repeated his stance that the war will continue until complete victory, which includes destroying Hamas. He says that is crucial to the national security of Israel. Yesterday, the IDF rescued two hostages from Rafah. Part of that operation involved intense airstrikes that killed more than 100 people, according to the Palestine Red Crescent Society. So far, in more than four months of war, the IDF has secured the freedom of three hostages. Netanyahu says the military option is the only way to do this, even though dozens of Israelis were released following negotiations back in November. Some analysts say the U.S. is expressing words of concern about Palestine Palestinian civilians, but not using its leverage to pressure Netanyahu to stop the IDF bombardment and possible ground incursion into Rafah. Washington provides just under four billion U.S. dollars in military aid annually to Israel. Today, the U.S. Senate passed a 14 billion dollar military package to Israel. It must still go through the Republican-controlled House before it reaches Biden's desk. The package also provides just over nine billion for civilians in Gaza and the West Bank. Abby Kowalas in CBC News, London. Melanie Jolie, Minister of Foreign Affairs, paid a visit to Washington today for meetings with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. They discussed the current global security situation, including the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. I was just in Ukraine looking mm. forward to debriefing you on it, uh, as well as uh, long-term peace in the Middle East, including uh, a two-state solution process. Jolie and Blinken also participated in a forum on hostage diplomacy. They each delivered a keynote address. Discussions explored how the international community can respond to and deter the arbitrary detention of individuals for diplomatic leverage. Canadian politicians last out today at pro-Palestinian demonstrators who gathered outside a Toronto hospital last night and reportedly blocked access to it. Mount Sinai Hospital has deep roots in the local Jewish community. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called the demonstration reprehensible and condemned it as anti-Semitic. Ontario Premier Doug Ford said the demonstrators may have violated the criminal code. It is illegal to intimidate health care workers or to prevent individuals from accessing health care. Folks, get some decency. Have common sense. These, these hospitals are there to save lives. You know, Mount Sinai did everything they could to save my brother's life. He was in there, and uh, they're an incredible hospital, along with all the hospitals around the province. They're there to help people. Do not, do not break the law, because that's exactly what happened. After the incident at the hospital, demonstrators were seen marching through the streets downtown. Some witnesses say they heard the demonstrators chanting support for Hamas. Toronto Police today confirmed they're investigating several incidents that took place in the area. Many parts of the country are experiencing unseasonably mild weather. That's certainly true in southern B.C., where the lack of snow is causing concern. Lindsay Duncombe explains. This is what drought looks like in the North Shore Mountains near Vancouver. Every month, Metro Vancouver hydrologists visit weather stations to measure the snow. There's not much to measure 900 metres above sea level. Yeah, so usually we'd, we'd see about two metres of snow here. Two metres, so that's like taller than me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Over our heads. This is part of the network of reservoirs and lakes that provide Vancouver's water supply. So what it really means is that we need to start thinking already about water conservation as we move into the drier months. This isn't just happening in the Vancouver area. Right across British Columbia, snowpack is low, and there are big worries about what that could mean for spring. 
The latest snowpack report shows an average snowpack 61% of normal. The hardest hit areas are where most people live. It's just what is extremely unusual is how low it is everywhere. Already, the province has called meetings with farmers to talk conservation. BC Hydro has had to import electricity and raise rates. Oil and gas producers told to make plans to store water for fracking operations. We have communities in local states of emergency because they don't have enough drinking water in February. It, that really starts to make people concerned for what that's going to look like in the summer. Higher in the mountains, the hydrologists find snow. So right now there's about a meter 10, 110 centimeters. About 30% of what we would usually see. There are still a couple of months of winter to go. Lots of snow could yet fall. But the scientists say don't count on it. The near forecast looks dry. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. For news you can trust, we have the latest on what's happening in your community and a weather forecast you can rely on no matter where you are in Atlantic Canada. I'm Amy Smith. And I'm Ryan Snodden. Join us for Atlantic Tonight. Right after the National.
All right, it's coming down there pretty mm. good here yeah, in Halifax yes. right now. I know. Mike Gorman just walked by and said the roads are kind of greasy mm. out there. For sure. Uh, starting to really accumulate now, especially in the southwest of the province, uh, where, again, you folks were into the snow bands earliest. Let's show you our viewer picture of the day, and then we'll show you kind of the latest. Uh, this is a beautiful one, and you think... Uh, they're not loving more snow at uh, Ski Martok. <laughs> I would say they are. And how about this one from Cal wow. Kill Collins? Mm -hmm. yeah, this lovely. was after that freezing fog we had a few right. nights ago. Yeah. Okay. And everything just coated there in a nice frost and beautiful shot there. Thanks to Cal. So there's the map in case you're just joining us. Uh, again, solid 10 to as much as 25 centimeters uh, across the south and eastern parts of the province. The closer you are to the Atlantic coastline, it looks like the heavier the snowfall will be, or at least the greatest chance. Now, this is visibility, and so we are down to 800 meters at Yarmouth, 400 meters in Halifax, 600 meters at the airport. Uh, and so, yeah, you can see where that visibility is lowest, where those bands of snow are coming down, and you couple that with the wind, visibility is not great out there. Mm -hmm. So just to, if you have to be out on the roads, do take your time, leave yourself extra time and space as this system will continue to move through this evening with those gusty winds. Quickly moves through though by 8 a.m. tomorrow. It's just basically Cape Breton last and you folks are done by lunchtime, although the blowing snow and the flurries and another little wave coming in tomorrow night will keep things greasy right into Thursday. Mm -hmm. Greasy okay. for sure. All right, winter or not, this is one of the busiest weeks for flower growers. That's right, and many farms in Columbia have been gearing up for Valentine's Day. Flower farmers have been working non-stop for what is the big day for their mm. industry. Many South American farms started production six months ahead. Workers have to pick and pack flowers for export, mostly to the U.S., which is their biggest consumer market. This woman says she talks to the flowers as she works <laughs> and even plays music for them. Okay. Last year, Columbia exported 52,000 tons of cut flowers in the lead up to Valentine's Day. That's a Day. lot of flowers. Maybe the music is helping. Is okay. tomorrow Valentine's oh, Day? Oh, get on that, Ryan. That's <laughs> it for uh -oh. us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.